Welcome to the Propreneur Podcast, where we help practice owners become better entrepreneurs. I'm your host, Dino Watt. And hello again, everybody. Welcome to Best Practices Podcast. I'm your host, Dino Watt, and I'm excited to talk with you today about a topic that I believe is crucial to understand in your practice. And I think it's one of those topics that a lot of people uh, fail to fully grasp because it does take some practice, it does take some time, and it actually is a muscle that you need to create. And today we have an expert on the line that's going to be helping us understand how to do that. What I'm talking about is conflict resolution, which the conflict resolution idea alone for a lot of people is scary, right? Oh, I don't want to com- confront somebody. Oh, confrontation is not my skill set. Yeah, but life happens and we all need to deal with it. And today, Sharon Dolak is here with us and she's going to teach us exactly how to overcome all of the conflict you've ever had, possibly, and ever will in your <laughs> in your practice. Sharon, thank you and welcome to the show. Um, thank you, Dina. I'm very pleased to be here with you. I don't know if I can do all of that in our little time together, but <laughs> I'll make my best attempt at it. Wait, I've overpromised? That's crazy. <laughs> Well, I'm excited because, you know, I think we all deal with this in one form or another, whether it be in our relationships, whether it be just in our life with other human beings on this planet, but definitely inside the practices. We deal with so much stress, so much challenge, whether it be with our team members or whether it be with our patients, we have to understand how to resolve the conflicts that show up. It's just a part of life. It's just going to happen. Will you please give us a quick introduction about you, why you do what you do, how you got to this position? I think a lot of people are very interested in finding out why you chose, out of all things, <laughs> conflict as your, as your uh, profession. Well, I am a woman on a mission with this, uh, Dino. I'll never forget one of my uh, earlier mediations. A uh, dentist had called me uh, to tell me that he had an issue with his wife Uh, within their marriage, but she was also a dentist and his partner in the practice. Mm. And he had come to him and said, we need to get some help. There are some issues in how we're raising our children, how we're running our practice, and we need to do something about this. And he wasn't there yet. Um, He chose to ignore it, as you can imagine. Mm. And a year down the road, she files for divorce. And, uh, as an attempt to help, uh, one of the things I do in one form of mediation is mediation to stay married. So I had them come in to to do mediation to see if they can work through some of their issues. And um, we got through the part where they tell their story about what happened from their own perspective. And it became very clear early on that she wasn't, she was done. Uh, she came up to me, she, she was crying, she gave me a hug and she said, thank you, Sharon, but I wish we would have done this sooner. It's just too late for me. She had stuffed so sad. It is. She had stuffed down so many resentments, so many hurts, uh, that there may have been a chance the year before when she first came to him, but mm-hmm. she, she was done. And, uh, you know, they lost a lot, uh, two children and a practice together. And it, it all could have been avoided. Um, I have a lot of people who say to me, gee, I wish I would have done it sooner. Um, mm-hmm. and, and they realize the benefit of getting through that conflict and how they can move forward. So I said to myself, hey, somebody's got to do something about this. Well, I'm as much as somebody as anybody. So yeah. I'm doing something about this. So that's what I've done. I, I um, uh, went through mediation training. I got all the certificates and the bells and whistles that I need to be able to practice in the state of Texas and any state really. And uh, I'm, I'm on a mission uh, to help dental offices and to help people who are interested in staying married. Wow. So much I want to unwrap from what you just said. <laughs> I love it. I, I love it. Well, first of all, I just like there's a, a kindred heart thing going on here because my that's where I started in my practice as well was uh, the relationship side of things I was a child of divorce and I was really wanted to understand relationships better and my wife and I put very specific systems and processes inside of our marriage so that we wouldn't be another statistic and um, I wanted to help people in their marriage and especially couples who are working together as you know 
can be a challenge, right? And it's uh, two different ideas, two different mindsets, not really understanding whose roles and responsibilities are what. So they get meshed together and very, mm -hmm. very convoluted. And I had a friend who was dealing with money. He was a financial advisor. And he's like, hey, money is the number one cause, uh, stated cause of divorce. I don't want to deal with it. Will you deal with them? And then, then I can help them in their money. And that's how it came to be. So really, I love that you have that background and that story. And I, 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 it is sad, you know, I mentioned that as you were talking, it's true. I just feel it's sad that people get to that place, not wanting to, out of a lot of reasons, right? Embarrassment, um, uh, feeling inadequate or less than, not wanting to reach out when they should have. And sometimes it is too late. It really is. It is a shame. And I think that, you know, a lot of times, uh, a dentist or business owner, practice owner will say, Hey, I, I, what is this? I know how to run a business. I know how to prepare a, the best dental case and, and prep it in the world. How is it that the age of 40 years old, I do not know how to deal with human relationships. And I think that's the big deal right there. So I'm encouraged, Absolutely. I'm encouraged dentists to step into this uncomfortable role and they need to look honestly with their team uh, what their culture is and what's Absolutely. going on because they are, there is conflict. It's going to happen. Well, yeah, like I was saying earlier, like us weird, the, us weird things of human beings, right? Like we are odd and we have one day will be one way and another day will be another. And, you know, the, the drive into work can completely change my mood and my attitude. And right. it, it, it's easy to say, well, it shouldn't be like that, but it is. And, um, I think that the work that you're doing is so important because I agree you have these, these people, men and women, who their whole life have been high achievers and have been able to figure it out, mm -hmm. right? They're mm -hmm. able to figure out, oh, this is a really crazy, intense case, but yeah. they'll figure it out. Right. right. And then when they're stuck with, I can't figure out how to just have a normal conversation with someone or, or overcome this frustration that I have. Wow, it's that's really really cool. Can I ask? Because I'd like to know this. I think it, it's important for people to know. Like, for you personally, why did this become a mission? Is there a personal connection you have to this? Like, for me, it was my parents divorced when I was eight years old, and I was that odd kid in school, and I don't want to be the odd kid. Or my mission is to never have another eight-year-old standing on a sidewalk watching his father drive away. Right? That's where I come from. Where's your come from? Yeah. Well. Two things. One, I'm divorced as well. Mm. And going through the, uh, the divorce process in the court system is horrifying. And if I can do anything in my mediation to stay married part of my practice to help couples stay together and avoid that, all, that's great. That's, yeah. uh, that's my mission there. And then also, I am a veteran hygienist. I've been a hygienist for over 30 years. I have experienced so much conflict in the mm. dental office and um, and it's difficult to navigate through that um, because um, people have to want to, <laughs> they have to want yeah. to address it. And yeah. a lot of times people end up just wanting to avoid it and hope that it'll go away or that person will just come up to me and say they're sorry and, and uh, it never happens. Really, when you avoid conflict, it gets worse. And it comes yeah. back in a way to bite you. Now, there's not to say there's not times where you should avoid conflict. Like if you're driving down the road and there's somebody who's having some road rage, you want to avoid yeah. conflict there. That's a good disclaimer. <laughs> we want to make sure we're not like, no, definitely engage. No, we're not saying that. <laughs> exactly. Just let the, move on down the road. That's what you want them to do. But you know, for as closely as everyone works in the dental office together, day to day, you spend a good part of your life there. Uh, you're dealing and working in a very difficult environment. You have patients who are scared and nervous. Your body's in contorted in many con It's a, it's a, you're going to have conflict. Yep. Get, yep. Change. Everybody's got to be uh, floating, but everybody needs to have a smile on their face and, and do the job. But it happens. It's going to happen. And you've got to feel comfortable in uh, addressing it. And, and the people that you're addressing it with need to feel safe and, and, and 
the culture needs to allow for that discussion to happen. And yeah. oftentimes it doesn't because it's never really put in place what to yeah. do is an issue. And so you got a bunch of people who don't know what they're doing trying to bake a cake without the right ingredients, without the right understanding, and exactly. so it becomes a big mess. I wonder if you uh, feel the same way I do on this. You know, you tell you told your story about the couple and for when she went to him first and said, hey, we have a problem. And then he was like, ah, you know, no big deal. We'll deal with it later. And then when finally he was willing to deal with it, I call this the foolish fire, fireman, right? It's the wife saying, hey, there's a, a hot spot in our home. And yeah, don't worry about it. It's fine. It's not a big deal. I've seen worse. And then it's like, no, there's smoke now coming up. It's like, ah, it's all right. It's fine. And oh, no, there's flames. And now you're jumping into action. And by that time, the house is going up in flames. And she's like, I'm done. I feel like the longer we put off the resolution of the conflict, the hotter the topic gets and the harder it is to actually overcome it in, in certain situations. Is that, would you say that that's- well, your, and that, your... That's very true. And the thing to remember as well is that conflict has been modeled for us uh, when we were growing up. Um, mm -hmm. There, you could have had a parent who avoided conflict, wanted to yeah. avoid to have the discussion because they didn't want to make the other parent mad. Or, or uh, you had a parent who wanted to accommodate the other one for fear of whatever. So we have a default mode when we, we uh, have conflict in our life so that when our adult relationships at work get in conflict, we often go back to that style that we were taught. And it's a skill that can be learned. It's first you have to recognize, okay, this is what I've always done, but it's not working for me anymore. You have to come to a more conscious level of, okay, this is not going to work in this particular situation. Uh, what am I going to do about it? And uh, you have to be willing to, you know, peel back the layers of the issue and, and, and go down that road and be uncomfortable. Um, so you have to fight, you have to fight what you were taught either directly or indirectly growing up. And you have to make it your mission to want to improve upon that as we deal with our other adult relationships. It just makes me think of, uh, there's the book, The Power of Habit by Charles Duhigg, right? Where we have, we have good habits and we have bad habits. Mm -hmm. They're all habits. Right. They're just habits we, were, we learned or we were taught. All right, so I want to ask you this: um, Why, why? Uh, it seems almost like a, a like you've been kind of talking around this or, or to this in some ways. But why is it important to resolve conflict in your private practice? And then how does that turn into your? You mentioned this two times now, I believe. Your mission, like mm -hmm. how how does this idea turn into your mission? Well, everybody works very closely together in a dental practice. I've told you that before. Uh -huh. But when there's conflict that is simmering in the background, you're paying your employees, your employees to be able to talk to their patients, treat your patients, get everything going properly in the office the way they should be. But behind the scenes, there's this rumbling going on. And if you think that patients are not sensing this, just like a doctor is, is can sense that a, a patient is nervous or uncomfortable, a patient is also taking the temperature of their surroundings and they can sense when there's a disturbance between the doctor and the practice and, and the, the assistant or anybody in the office, they can sense when there's a disturbance. So if you're a dental office that uh, tracks while people are walking out the back door, uh, you have new patients coming in, but you also have patients leaving, I guarantee you, not all, but some of those people felt something was amiss in the office uh, between the dentist and the staff or, or staff members. So leaving it unresolved, that conflict, ignoring it and hoping it goes away is going to cost you a lot of money in terms of opening uh, in your schedule, people falling off the books, people not accepting treatment your staff isn't gonna be engaged 100% in that. Their team is going to be at some level swirling around in this conflict. It's, that's so wise, right? Like, it's just so wise to put it in that perspective of understanding that 
people feel that difference. You think that you're really good about hiding it. It's kind of like the parents who argue all the time and think the kids don't recognize it. It's like, yeah, they, they see it. They know they're, they're feeling it. Exactly. And, and to put it in the context of money, look, the fact of the matter is that sales and money, it's the breath of a business. If you don't have sales, you're going to be out of business pretty soon. Yeah. And if you're creating an environment where people are feeling uncomfortable, they might not even be able to tell you what it is. They're just like, mm, we've all been in that situation before. We're like, something's up. I don't know what it is, but yeah. something's up. And I don't want to go back into that. Right. I went wow. to it. I went to a dental conference. I was doing some networking with a bunch of uh, a bunch of teams, and uh, I approached a table of a female dentist and her staff, and I told them what I did, and I handed her my card, and, and uh, she looked at the card. She tossed it back to me, literally tossed it back to me, and with bravado said, "Oh, we'll just fire them," and I said. Wow. The, do you know, the body language and the looks on their, the team's face was a mix of fear and complete disgust. I felt so sorry for that group and for her because you can fire somebody, but you've lost all the training that that person has, all the knowledge that you paid for to take them to, to places like that. Then you have to spend time hiring somebody retraining them, getting them up to your standards of level of the office, the time you, you can't calculate the amount of money that's spent uh, taking that amount of time. So I think firing is important in some cases, but you need to also do it prudently. You need to do it with restraint and see if this is an issue that can be overcome. Well, I love that you're mentioning this. Um, and I know this isn't a, uh, I, we didn't set this up people ahead of time. You know, I have a, I have a new book coming out uh, next month called Hire and Fire Like a Boss, right? And uh -huh. the idea around it is, is that first of all, to understand that if you're not hiring correctly and you do have a bad hire, you're, you are losing a ton of money. I, I, I don't have the stats right in front of me, but it's something around U.S. Department of Labor Statistics. If you have a $50,000 a year employee, what you hire incorrectly that person it costs you seventy thousand dollars at a minimum mm -hmm. right so so you're paying like you're writing a check basically yeah. mm -hmm. um and i think that the challenge is when you have that type of attitude uh, amongst many challenges but one of the challenges when you have that attitude is that you'll eventually run out of people who are willing to put up with your tyrannical ways right right and 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 boy do you really want to live in a world where all you're doing is just like, well, I'll just fire them. It's like, well, gosh, like that's not, and, and, and I understand that's obviously something that comes from their past and the way that they were raised and mm -hmm. they, they don't deal with conflict obviously yeah. well, because look, I think that conflict sometimes gets a bad rap. I am one who thinks that if you are not having some conflict, you're not working hard enough. You're not trying hard enough. Exactly. You're not allowing people to be who they are. Right. We don't want to live in a world where it's like, you must do this only. I want people to push back. I used to say, even in my marriage, I, I enjoy it when my wife and I argue because I know she has an opinion and I know that she's not just going to be pushed over and it helps me see things differently. Right. So I actually think what you do is, is a huge service to so many people. I love it. I love and it. Along with what you said with that, as far as there is positive sides to conflict, conflict, if you just stay with the same thing, you don't change and grow, you actually go backwards. But when you have conflict, it's what's going, if handled properly, it's going to propel you forward. The conflict means there's a problem. There's a problem, I need to do something about it. And then if you are awake and conscious about it and not wanting to avoid it, you're gonna look at the problem and it's gonna move a practice or a marriage forward in, in growth and it's, well, then that, I guess, brings us to the question, which is, you've seen so many people, you deal with uh, so many different personality types. And I mean, I, I guess you could say all of us do, but you, you've, you've decided to take this on as your profession. So I think you're a really great person, person to answer this question of how do most people then tend to uh, respond to conflict, whether that be the leader or the, the employee? Well, 
you know, Thomas Kilman inventory, I don't know if you're familiar with that, it's called the TKI. When I'm doing some of my mediations where people are interested in learning their conflict modes and how they normally react, you can administer or I administer that inventory. But basically, uh, I have six A's, I, I like to call it. You can avoid, which is one, uh, where you avoid the conflict, as we talked about before. You can accommodate, meaning you give in um, just to get along. Uh, you can get, and that, that behavior gets rewarded. So that's, that's not necessarily a good thing. It would be repeated. Uh, you can get angry and argue, and we know, all know what that does. Sure. Or you can approach this person and address the situation proactively. And that's the goal. That's what the goal should be, is to be able to um, approach it uh, openly with it. I mean, conflict, when we're in conflict, it's a story that we tell ourselves. Something happened. We review it in our minds over and over again, and it, you talk to other people about it to get comfort, to get understanding, and as you keep on repeating this conflict event in your mind, you start to think it's true, and it's accurate, and it's exactly what happened, and you become blinded to really what the other person has experienced. So you become entrenched in your position, and part of my job uh, when I am mediating a dispute is to get people to see that there is another side to the story. And the way to do that and the way practice owners can do it, it's a skill that can be learned. You ask your patients, what's bothering you? Tell me about that. Um, how is that making you feel? How is it affecting you in your day-to-day -day living? You're, you're asking these open-ended questions. And you can do that with a patient. It's a skill that you learn. Uh. It's also a transferable skill. It's a transferable skill that you can use in your marriage or your work relationships. Ask a lot of open questions and you'd be surprised the answers that you'll get. I, I love that idea of, you know, continually asking open ended questions because you, you then become the investigator as opposed to the accuser, right? Exactly. And that is a really interesting take on it where I think it's important for us to, to get to this place with our human connection with one another to just understand on a more consistent basis that my perspective, even if I'm sitting in the same room, listen to the same thing you did, is going to be different than yours. Exactly. And if I get to that place, then we now can have a real conversation of understanding. So would you say that that is the strategy you typically will use to help the dentist or the team unlock those conflict events? Absolutely. I, I had an opportunity to uh, mediate a group practice, a fairly large group practice. Um, it was between the hygienists uh, and the doctor and the office manager. Um, the hygienists got word that they were to increase production um, start talking about RPSs more, deep scaling and replanings, talk about ortho more. They, they had in, the office manager and the dentist had increased their, their monthly goals. And in their mind, it kind of changed. It was like kind of like a bait and switch thing for them. So it got them stirred up a little bit. Well, this isn't what you said before. This is where we're yeah. here. And uh, the other issue that was brought up was that they were changing their compensation package from being hourly rate to commission based. So that stirred up a lot of issues there, as you can imagine. So I went in there and, and uh, heard each side of their story and basically have to ask a lot of questions to each party so that the other person can understand, okay, what was, what was meant by this? What's your intention about this? Help me to understand why we have to sell more RPSs is, is, is their thinking. Uh, why we need to talk about this more. Um, why are we going on commission? And, you know, as the hygienists were venting all of this and not understanding, the dentist was becoming visibly upset. And I said, hey, time out. What's, what's going on here? Why, why are you upset? And he says, this is not, this wasn't the intention at all. He, he wanted to make them more productive for first one reason to help the practice. I mean, insurance benefit packages are paying less and less Sure. And you need to make more money to sustain a practice. Mm -hmm. But the other reason is going on commission for this particular practice 
he felt would be a good thing for the, the hygienists who were wanting raises, wanting an increase in benefits. And here are ways in which you can do this. Um, and through the discussion, it's really amazing for me to see as a mediator, to see the light bulbs go off in mm, your eyes when they yep. start to, by, by getting through an uncomfortable situation, a conversation, you start to gain some understanding. And then you say, oh, okay, it wasn't what I was thinking in my head. This is the reason I can buy into that. And it's remarkable for me to see where instead of the pointing fingers, like you said, they start to look at the problem out here and they're on the same side now looking at the problem over there and start talking about what can I do? What can we do to make this a win solution for everybody? What can we do to make you comfortable doing this and, and help us sustain the practice? And that's what we went through asking a lot of questions about this. And it came out that, Hey, the hygienists, they're okay with it. They want to do it in an ethical way. And then the dentist was able to, um, it was a very complex case, but the dentist was able to give them guidelines that they could feel comfortable with so that they can do this. And it, it was just neat to see that transformation between them. Well, it's interesting that in the end, most of our conflict tends to be because one person's perception of the way they communicated something is one way and the way somebody might have heard it or perceived it or uh, taken it in in their own understanding is is a completely different way you know i think that's a great example of here the dentist is sitting back going why are they so upset about this i think this is a great thing exactly. for them right i want to make them more money i want to create that and you know conversation in most cases communication in most cases is all about the setup and if you have a bad setup the rest of it's going to go pretty dang badly. Exactly. I, I also love, I can just see you in my mind's eye, right? As you're sitting in that room and you're asking these questions, which for the most part, because of what you do, I'm sure often it's like, how can we have an ask this question, guys? Like, do you not see this right in front of you? And sometimes they don't. And then you're like, when they finally do it, it's like, aha, you know, it's like no, the revolution. I mean, exactly. Yeah. 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 That's, that's awesome. Well, uh, you are a joy to speak with. I have a couple of questions that I like to ask all of our guests just to okay. give some references to everybody. Is that okay if we play along? Go for it. Awesome. So what do you feel, is, and I think I know what the answer is on this, is the most expensive thing that private practice owners are missing within their practice? Well, I would say a clear understanding of the office goals, their mission, and a system to handle the conflict when the team starts to veer away from that goal that goal is is so powerful right because mm -hmm. it's that it's that marker that we can all get to that we can that's say oh that's the flag on top of the mountain we're going there rightfully said very good yeah. yes exactly yeah. right yep all right so what's uh, a book i love books i love audiobooks mostly because my dyslexia but every private practice owner you think should read which one you know what which one i had three but one okay. some oldies and goodies People skills that helps with your ability to listen. It's an oldie but goodie. Resolving conflicts in the workplace. That's nice. always good. That's that's yep. something a dentist can read and a team can read and gain a lot of information. This one here is my all-time favorite, and I'm gonna read it again. It's called Three Impossible Promises: The Inspiring True Story of Olympic Gold and How Organizational Culture Means Everything. It is a, a story, a true story of um, the a coach a gymnastic coach who uh had a group of young gymnastic girls and how she changed the culture of what training in gymnastics was in the olympics to allow them to reach olympic gold uh, wow. in barcelona it is really an inspiring story i probably didn't give it justice there but it's one of my favorite books and it's something that uh, there's a lot of takeaways that can be used uh, in any organization on how to treat your people and create a culture that would allow people to be productive and uh, performing at their very best. And it's told in story format? Yeah. 
Yeah. Oh, I love that. I love, I love mm -hmm. a good parable, you know, type story where yeah. we can always go back and think. And you can always find different nuances uh, to the story as well. The more times you read it, that's yeah. great. I've never heard about that. We'll definitely have that in the show yeah. notes for people to be able to click on yeah. that. Good. And to get that. That's great. Thank you. Good recommendation. Um, so, and speaking of books and my book, The Practice Rx, one of the things I really focus on is team culture and team performance as, as truly the foundation of what I believe is, is the only way to grow your business. What do you see as you go into these practices and you visit different doctors, you have conversations with them, what do you see as the biggest challenge that private practice owners are facing in their teams and their office culture at this time? I think that the biggest challenge is hiring and keeping good employees who are loyal and aligned to the office's goals and their mission. And I would say that my best advice, it comes from a quote uh, from E.M. Foster. He says, um, he was asked, what is the secret of life? And he said only two words. And those two words were only connect. Learn how to communicate what we care about so others can care about it as well. And that would mm. be what I would say. Wow, that's awesome. That's very yeah, cool. One of my favorites. I, what um, I don't, I hate uh, saving this till the very end. So I want to make sure we get this in here. What uh, is the best way for people to reach out to you and connect with you? Oh, I can give my phone number, or they can go to dentaldisputeresolution.com, and my phone number is eight one seven seven eight one seven nine one zero, or by email at sharon at sharondolakmediation.com. Thank you for that. I love, uh, yeah, absolutely. I love that you're so specific and that and the, I don't like to be able to mediate and realize that people need to sometimes just have a go between in between, you know, the higher the emotion, the lower IQ, right? So the more I'm upset about something, the dumber I become. I know that in my own life. And yet to have somebody step in the middle and go, well, here's where you could be looking at this way and ask better questions. I think that's so powerful. No, it's so, true. Go ahead. No, I just gonna I go to the next thing. Okay, go ahead. Oh, it's fine. Uh, I just want to know. I was gonna ask you if the advice that you just gave us is. Would you say that's the best advice you've ever received in your life or business? I, I think so. Address issues immediately, proactively, uh, in a culture that is that values open, respectful communication. Um, mm -hmm. Don't wait. Waiting doesn't do any good. It just makes things worse. It just festers, right? Like a. <laughs> Like a yes. Access. <laughs> yes. Well, I'm 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 pretty known in in my community anyway, especially with all my clients, is that I use the word you know a staff is an infection nobody wants to build a team. <laughs> That's and right. so, then there are staff infections that come into our offices sometimes. But don't be like as the doctors, especially don't want to be that. What's the best resource or tool that you think every private practice owner should be using right now to grow their business? Any book on conflict resolution? Makes sense. I mean, I think we're dealing in a world, we're dealing in a world today where there is uh, perceived conflict. There's, um, there's advanced conflict, meaning that there are news outlets that are telling you how we must be upset and must be angry about things. And that there's this idea that there's this divide between millennials and, you know, generation X and, and baby, like, instead of just realizing that, like, if we don't understand how to speak to one another mm -hmm. on a conflict resolution level, on a respectful level, then we can overcome a lot. It's so true. And I'll tell you what, when I go into an office and I mediate areas where they cannot get beyond the conflict themselves, um, it's really they that are doing the heavy lifting. I'm just a facil facilitator of that communication. I'm a good listener and I can find out what's going on below the surface just by listening and help draw that out of them with um, some certain questioning techniques. And they are really the ones that are doing the heavy lifting. They are really solving their own problems. And when they solve their own problems and when they can come up with solutions themselves instead of having that solution dictated to them, it's adhered to much longer and much better when someone is part of the solution than having something thrust upon them like that. So um, it, it is a neat thing to see. Uh, people are able to do it. It's just a oh. will to, to want to. 
hundred percent. And I know that there are people like you that are out there to help facilitate that, help them. I believe in the phrase, uh, people support what they help create, right? And so mm -hmm. that you are someone that's available to have them learn the skills and the techniques and the tools that were not taught in school, exactly. that were poorly taught by a lot of the people in our world, right? Our parents or our close friends, and um, that you are there, Sharon, I so appreciate you being here and, and giving a voice to something that I think is very, very important that is not going away anytime soon, right? It's not a fad, you know, <laughs> conflict isn't a fad, unfortunately, because we are human beings. But, uh, you know, everyone that's listening, I just really would recommend reach out to Sharon, find out what you can do, even in small little manners, if you would, to increase the communication, avoid the conflict, resolve the conflict that's going to absolutely happen inside your practice. Thank you for being with us today, Sharon. I so appreciate it. I know everybody listening does too. Thank you, Dino. I appreciate the opportunity. You were great. Thanks so much again for listening to the ProPreneur Podcast. We really appreciate your support. If you haven't subscribed already, please make sure you do so. Also, if you feel like you might be a good fit for our podcast as a guest or know somebody who you think would be, go ahead and email us at dino at dinowatt.com. Again, thanks for support. We'll see you on the next episode.